This episode of Literary Treks is brought to you by Audible.com, offering more than 180,000 titles for smartphone, tablet, and desktop. To get a free audiobook of your choice and to help Trek FM at the same time, visit audibletrial.com slash trekfm. And also by Enterprise in Space, an international program of the nonprofit National Space Society. Find out how you can help science and education and become a virtual crew member aboard the NSS Enterprise Orbiter by visiting enterpriseinspace.org. And if you want to join the conversation and share your thoughts on this episode, join the Babel Conference, our listeners group on Facebook. Just type B-A-B-E-L into the Facebook search field. We look forward to seeing you there. Hey everyone, I'm Rod Roddenberry and you're listening to Trek FM. taking all these books? I thought I'd take some light reading, in case I got bored. Welcome, everyone, to another episode of Literary Treks. This is episode number 271. I am just one of your hosts of five other hosts. No, 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 no. I'm just kidding. It's just me and Dan. I, this is Bruce Gibson. I've got Dan Gunther with me. Dan, as always, you're here. I am here. I was I was kind of worried there. I was like, are there episodes being recorded that I don't know about that? Like five, five hosts. I just love when I said five hosts. I look at you and you're like looking around the room like, where are they? <laughs> <laughs> like they're kind of all of a sudden just bust the door down and walk into your room. We're here. Oh, I didn't even know. <laughs> Crazy. No. It's just the two of us. Just the two of us. I was thinking the exact same thing. Doing literary tracks. Just the two of us. You and I. <laughs> <laughs> oh, uh, wow. Welcome to the Sing Along Trek show. <laughs> but no, that's, you know, what we've got today. We have a feature and it's reviewing a new TOS book called The Captain's Oath by Christopher L. Bennett. And that is coming up in the feature on today's show. So stick around for that. But in the meantime, we have a new comic that we want to discuss. It's Star Trek Year 5, issue number 2. So, Dan, I hope that you read this because I'm not going to talk about this by myself. I did indeed read this one. And, uh, man, I I don't know about you and kind of giving everything away here. I am really digging this series. Like the art, every. Oh, man. Anyway, we'll talk about it. But wow. No, I'm with you on that. I mean, just when you said art, I, I was looking at every panel saying to myself, I love this art. <laughs> I, want, mm-hmm. I want this art in every Star Trek comic. Yeah. And in this issue in particular, so many um, pages that are spread out over two pages, you know, where you've got like the big top graphic at the top of the page and then uh, panels along the bottom. And there's so many of those in this issue that are just gorgeous. Like uh, we're getting maybe a little too far into it now, but the shot of the Tholian ship firing on the Enterprise there, like that is so beautiful. Well, the one thing I was noticing is when we look at Star Trek comics, and there's a lot of times where we say, oh, you know, the art looks really good on some panels, and you know, where the it looks just like the actors, but then there's other panels where eh, it doesn't look quite right, or it doesn't look like that person, or I couldn't tell if that was Spock or McCoy. But I think every panel on this is spot on. Yeah, definitely. The likenesses of the characters are just so perfect. And it's not even in that, in the sense of like, oh, I can tell where they gra- use the screen grab and, and, you know, use that as, as a model for this. These look very original, but the, the characters are just so spot on. And the environments and the sets within the Enterprise, I think, are just absolutely beautiful. We've had some great art in many of the Star Trek comics. And uh, so I want to call out on this one. It's Stephen Thompson is the artist and the colorist is Charlie Kirchhoff. So, uh, 
yeah, we're off to a great start in these first two issues. And of course, we're picking up where we left off with issue number one, where we're dealing with the Tholians. And the Tholians are just kind of so cool to me. I mean, they're just so different and they're very alien looking. And they found on this uh, colony planet where the Tholi- where some Tholians were that they had been attacked. And this is an issue number one where they find a child Tholian that they bring up to the Enterprise. And it's in sick bay and it's behind a force field. And so they're studying it and keeping an eye on it. But at the same time, a Tholian ship arrives and starts attacking them. Well, starts to threaten t- the Enterprise, but then not long after that, they go to attack them. But it's a different Tholian ship than what we've seen on the series. This mm-hmm. almost looks like like a wasp or a hornet or something like that to me in, in the shape of the ship. And then it fires this, this ray through the hull of the ship, but doesn't destroy the hull, but it actually vaporize some of the crew members in the ship. Yeah, and I thought that was a really interesting weapon and and how it's visualized here is really cool. So yeah, the the bulkheads and everything like the hull of the Enterprise is completely unaffected, but the the people are completely vaporized only a few feet away from some other people who aren't affected at all. They just see this happening and that I think was a really cool visual. Yeah, and then we get to a couple of scenes here that I really like between uh, the different crew members, where we have Kirk, Spock, and McCoy in one of the conference rooms discussing what to do next, because they've now taken off away from the Tholian ship. They're in warp, uh, trying to run away from it. And there's a very good discussion where Kirk is on one side of things of basically you know, we need to be involved and we have this child Tholian where Spock and McCoy are like, why are we even getting involved with the Tholians? This isn't our, we don't even know that much about them. We don't even, we can't even read their language. We can't even translate their language. And, you know, are you being emotional, Kirk? What is it that's driving you? Because this is not logical. We should just give the Tholian child over to them. We don't know what their intentions are or what they're going to do to the child. We don't even know if they attack the Tholian colony. I mean, so they're kind of this opinion of, you know, we, this isn't our affair. We don't know what's going on. We're the ones kind of interfering. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And the very pragmatic side of me totally agrees with them. But Kirk has this suspicion that it was the Tholians themselves that attacked their own colony and sees, you know, taking this child as uh, a, a mercy thinking that these Tholians want that child for nefarious purposes, that they were trying to kill everybody on that planet. And uh, we soon find out that his uh, supposition, his his kind of gut feeling on that turns out to be correct. And it looks like the weapon that was used to attack the colony is the same one as we were just talking about that they used on the Enterprise. And this weapon is being discussed on the bridge. So while they're in the conference room, there, uh, we have Scotty, Yahora, Chekhov, and Sulu on the bridge, and they're having a discussion trying to figure out what this weapon was that was used, how it was used, how can it go through the hull without affecting the hull in any way, but only vaporizing the people within. And they come to find out that it's some kind of, I don't know, some kind of thing that scrambles the molecules, makes them cold, like freezing or something, and makes them shatter. I don't know, something like that. Yeah, basically <laughs> it's a zero stops, frequency. Yeah, it basically stops all molecular movement, which means it's brought to absolute zero, the coldest anything can be, and, and it disassembles at that point, which is a really fascinating idea for the weapon. <laughs> yeah. And then we see uh Kirk going to talk to the Tholian child in Sick Bay, and I, I just like how this plays out. There's a lot of dialogue. He's talking about his experience in Tarsus IV, how he was part of a colony that was attacked by people like himself that were humans. It wasn't another race. It wasn't an alien. It was, you know, of course, Kodos. But he's trying to relate to this being because he suspects that this Tholian colony was attacked by its own people, the Tholians. And he's trying to connect with this. And we go through a few pages like this and some pages where there's no dialogue. It's just the, the matter of them connecting and him putting his hand, I guess on the glass encasing that it's in. Yeah. And this to me, I I found this the most powerful part of the comic. I really liked that insight 
into why Kirk is taking this so personally, I guess, and why he's willing to go so far because he really does see a kinship with this being and, uh, you know, really connects with it. And we kind of get a hint right at the end, uh, when Kirk says to him, you know, give me a sign, you know, do you understand me? And he's like, you said, he's got his hand up on the, the partition there and very slowly the Tholian turns its head and kind of leans its head on the glass. And, uh, I, I just very powerful moment. I really, this, this comic had more emotion and power to it than I was expecting. Yeah, I think that's a good way to say that. I agree. It does have a lot of emotion and power and really some insight into the character of Kirk. Uh, So I'm really interested to see where this series goes because the focus, I think, is going to stay on Kirk for a while. Mm -hmm. But yeah, so, you know, the crew decides, oh, we can, we found a way that we can actually convert their weapon back to if they shoot at us, we can reflect it back on them. And he's like, you know, we're not. He's basically, you know, we're not here to destroy the Tholians, you know, uh, but then he remembers about the device they have, the Einstein Rosen Euroboros that is used for that star that's going like supernova from the first issue. If they can use that because it bends energy beams and stuff, and it could basically, in a way, capture the Tholian ship. And if they give in to talking and, and stand down they'll be fine. But if they go to fight it, they'll be, they'll destroy themselves. And of course the Tholians decide, well, we're going to be aggressive and they pull away from it and they're destroyed. And again, in one of those beautiful two page, uh, you know, splash pages here, we see the end result of that decision on the part of the Tholian commander. And uh, it's just gorgeous. I, I know I'm just saying that a lot <laughs> with this comic, but it really is beautiful. And I mean, the whole thing ends with really them, you know, continuing their mission, but it's about Kirk, you know, I don't know. I, it just ends with Kirk seeming like, you know, he just, he has hope. He's got, oh, wait, oh no, wait, I'm sorry. I'm messing up. (laughs) Oh man. I didn't notice. Sorry. I didn't notice either. The, the, the flash forward again to the guy with the, the gun to the back of his head. Yeah. That's what was throwing me off. I did not notice that. I didn't either until I just re-looked at it. I forgot all about that. So yeah, that's how issue one started was there was a gun to his head and there was this flashback. But now we're seeing in the final page, there's one panel with the gun to his head again, even Mm -hmm. though that's not part of the scene. It's just kind of inserted in there. Interesting. I'm really curious to see where this all goes for sure. Because yeah, I had forgotten about that whole situation. So wow. Hmm. Yeah. Interesting. So issue one, that was the first page with the gun and issue two, it's the last page. Indeed. All right. Well, let's go ahead and get to some listener feedback for episode number 269, which was called Kellogg's Spock and Crisp. And that episode was named that because I said that I love to eat my Kellogg's Spock and Crisp for breakfast. (laughs) (laughs) Because this is where we're talking about the Gold Key comics. This was Gold Key Comics. Archives, Volume 5, Part 1, where we did the first three issues in that volume. And then the next episode, 270, is where then we talk about the last three issues. So this is, again, focusing on the first three issues. And, oh my gosh, Justin Ozer had a comment. I'm surprised by that. Justin never makes a comment. Have you noticed? That's amazing. Never. Oh, it's great to hear from him. <laughs> <laughs> he says that he loves the episodes where we talk about the Gold Key comics because... There's so much fun to listen to, and there's parts where he can't stop laughing. So he talks about Dwarf Planet, which is the first issue uh, in this uh, volume, and he says it reminds him of the animated series, The Terratin Incident, which aired the year before Gold Key, he says, and that's where the crew encounters a tiny city, and the crew themselves eventually start shrinking. And as for Yohora being spelled Yohoryu here... Before I became a big Star Trek fan, I actually thought it was Yohoryu. See, Justin confused them. That's what it was. <laughs> there it is. Yeah. They shouldn't have had him as a consultant. <laughs> <laughs> right. Well, it's funny that he actually thought she was named Yohoryu when she, he be first was becoming a fan. So that's interesting. And it is a pretty common mistake. So, it, And it's more common name, I think, than Yohora. I think we talked about that mm-hmm. in one of the episodes. So, and then he also says, seeing a small number of the same faces over and over, the perfect dream, which is the second issue, reminded him of the TNG episode, Up the Long Ladder, where the Mariposans 
have been cloned from the original five settlers, and the clone of Spock made him think of the TAS episode, The Infinite Vulcan, with the giant Spock clone, which would have been right at home in a gold key comic. Yes, <laughs> Justin, I agree with you that. And wasn't that one written by uh, Walter Koning? Oh. Who plays Chekhov? Was that I think one, he wrote The, one, the Infinite. Was that one written by him? It could have been, yeah. Where's Aaron Harvey when I need him? Uh, yep, in The Infinite Vulcan, written by Walter Koenig. So that's the one. There you go. Walter Koenig wrote it. Got it. Check off. <laughs> oh, and then David Plummer says it's always, he's always glad to see someone remember Spock 2, <laughs> who, for all we know, is still running around alive and somewhere in the canonical Trek universe. <laughs> yeah, I, always, I sometimes think about that, the fact that he's out there somewhere. It's really weird. <laughs> yeah, we need a follow-up story to that. <laughs> Definitely. Maybe that'll be one of the new series that CBS puts out. It'll just be focusing on him. <laughs> you know, usually I th when you go to say something, I think, oh, he's going to say what I'm thinking because you usually do. I, was, I thought you were going to say that would make a good waypoint. Ah, oh, that would actually make a better waypoint. <laughs> That's a more serious <laughs> answer for sure. Um, so Justin also has another comment here about uh, the third story, Ice Journey, and he put a separate comment for that one because it deserves its own consideration for how wacky and ridiculous it is. Uh, and he kind of agrees with me here when he says, basically the enterprise goes to a Federation planet to take a census. And in the end, a civil war breaks out and their planet's about to die anyway. And they just leave. And he says, wow, is the right word for that. It's amazing that the planet is so cold that they have to communicate telepathically and they can take pills to ward off the effects of extreme heat from flames. Uh, yeah, that all seemed way too complicated. And I was wondering the same thing Justin does here where he says, you know, why not use an environmental suit or a life belt, which we saw in the animated series. Yeah, this story sounded like one of the most confusing and bizarre ones in any Star Trek comic. I laughed a lot when you were talking about Ice Journey, but it sounds like the actual reading of it wasn't quite as fun. Thank you for taking precious time that you'll never get back to give us this episode. Well, you are welcome. <laughs> <laughs> and I mean, don't get me wrong. It It is fun reading these because they're so off the wall, but that one left me very perplexed. I, I just love the idea that yeah. now I have, now I have the idea that heat resistant pills exist. And I would never have had that idea if uh, not, if not for reading these. I tell you, I could use those pills when I'm mowing the lawn because I do <laughs> yes. not do well with heat. <laughs> <laughs> And then Chris Hill says, like Justin said, dwarf plant definitely sounds like a lot like a lot like the Terratin incident. So there you go. But we're getting a lot of uh, TAS references in here. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we, we almost needed stuff. to bring Aaron Harvey on to talk about this stuff. It would have been interesting. Well, speaking of not of Aaron Harvey, but David Plummer makes the comment. I love these episodes. The goal key discussions were the ones that really got me into the show. <laughs> wow. I'm so sorry. All I right. love that. <laughs> he says... Like folks have said, a lot of the plot hooks and, som and sometimes whole stories have a weird similarities to some of the animated series episodes. There you go. Which is especially interesting for the comics that came out first. That said, all the stuff like antifreeze uniforms, we have to communicate through telepathy, and Mr. Spock, take these heat stabilizer tablets, often makes the comics feel like they're kind of silly, lazy writing you'd expect from a cartoon, as compared to actual TAS, which, despite many of its flaws often managed to be surprisingly reasonable Star Trek follow-up. I agree. Yeah. You know, maybe sometimes it's a little unfair to compare these to TAS because I think most of the writing is pretty spot on, not as silly as the gold keys. I think gold keys, the gold keys, I think, are really on one other end. Yeah. Not all the time, but most of the time. <laughs> From Yeah. Basically, I, I feel like... You know, the exception to the gold key comics are when they're fairly reasonable and the exception for the animated series are when they're off the wall wacky and their normals are on different, different ends for sure. The gold keys are usually very off the wall wacky while the animated series, like David Plummer says, is usually pretty reasonable and, and makes a good continuation of TOS. Absolutely. Well, <laughs> I've enjoyed the Gold Key comics, and I think there is a volume six out there, so we're not done yet. <laughs> so, yes, Heaven there'll forbid. be more coming at some point. Heaven forbid. <laughs> <laughs> 
Well, speaking of feedback, we got an email from Al Meyer. And this is not related to Gold Key. Well, no, it is. I'm sorry. It is related to Gold Key. My gosh, we're never going to end, right? (laughs) He says, I really enjoyed your show about the Gold Key comics. I was rolling on the floor with laughter. I could especially relate to the discussion about the Delta Airlines snacks selection. The Gold Key (laughs) comics. You know, next time I'm on a flight, which is coming up soon, I'm going to get Cheez-Its and think of both of you. Okay. (laughs) Al says, the Gold Key comics were a little before my time, though. I was wondering if there were any plans to review the Marvel comics Star Trek adaptation. I went through my collection today and found about 10 issues of the series and thought they may make for a good show. Keep up the good work. I look forward to your podcast every other Sunday evening. Well, I did confirm with Al when he was talking about the Marvel Comics uh, adaptations. Uh, this would be the ones, yeah, that came right after the motion picture. Well, first there was the, uh, they actually cut, I think they did issues of the motion picture. And mm-hmm. then there were some original stories after that. I remember, I think it was my brother bought one of those issues back then when they were first being released. And I somehow got hold of it afterwards. Hmm. And I think I have it somewhere. But I do have the rest on the CD-ROM of past right. comics. So maybe maybe we'll go venture into... Actually, when we get through all the gold keys, that's probably the next thing we should do, is then start doing that Marvel run. Because I remember it being a little out there at times. Yeah, I, I, I've seen a few of them here and there, and I have that same DVD and uh, I've perused a couple issues kind of thing. And uh, I remember that being kind of crazy, too. I, di- I didn't read them when they were first coming out, but... I've definitely seen them in later years, so that could be a lot of fun for sure. There you go. There's just so much to cover and such little time. (laughs) (laughs) Well, speaking of time, it's time to go into our feature. So stick around, buckle up, because we're going warp speed right now. On today's feature, we are reviewing the new TOS novel, The Captain's Oath by Christopher L. Bennett. And this is an original novel about Kirk's early years, shortly before taking command of the Enterprise. So, Dan, your first impressions when you heard of this book, was this something that you were interested in reading? Yeah, I mean, <laughs> it's me. It's a Star Trek novel. I'll I know. Be I mean, what kind of question <laughs> was that, right? <laughs> but, you know, this in particular, uh, first I'd heard that Christopher L. Bennett was going to be writing a new original series novel. And I kind of assumed that it would be in the, you know, post uh, Star Trek, the motion picture era, because he really likes playing around in that time. Uh, yeah. But then, I it's, you know, too. the blurb came out and we found out it was about uh, Kirk's early voyages before taking command of the enterprise. And I really like that because that's something we don't know a lot about. We know, you know, he was a Lieutenant on the Farragut And he was probably a captain before the Enterprise because the Enterprise is a pretty important ship. But, you know, we don't really know a lot about that story. So I I thought that was really cool that we were getting something set there. Hey, I saw the bad robot movies. I thought he got command of the Enterprise while he was still a cadet. (laughs) (sighs) Oh, that's a different universe or timeline. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Forget that. Forget that. Yes, yes, yes. Well, yeah. So, uh, yeah, I was the same way. I was thinking it was going to be post TMP. And, uh, but yeah, I mean, it, it, it's cool because I was like, oh, this would be great. We'll, you know, see that period of time with Kirk that we don't see very often. And uh, we did ask Christopher L. Bennett to join us, because, but because of scheduling conflicts, he couldn't join us. But he went ahead and uh, answered some of our questions. So we will be reading his answers to you. So he's here in spirit, everyone. So we're going to give you some of our thoughts about the novel and read some of the comments that Christopher sent to us. So one of the first things I want to touch on as we're talking about the early years of Kirk is this novel not just only focuses on those first few years before the Enterprise, but also right when he takes command of the Enterprise. So the way the book is structured, there we start at one time period, then we backtrack to another time period, then we go forward, then back and forward. It's not a time travel story, but we're visiting this roughly five year period of like 2261 to 2265 of Kirk's command years aboard another starship and leading up to the Enterprise. So we're kind of back and forth in in the way the story is framed. So, Dan, I was wondering, 
from your perspective, did you like how that format worked? Did it work for you? It was initially a little bit jarring to kind of jump back and forth. Uh, I, I had a little bit of a hard time early on kind of keeping straight where the story was and, oh, wait, no, this one was happening back on the Sacagawea and, you know, this one was happening on the Enterprise. Oh, okay, okay. You know, but by the end, I kind of liked how, you know, the two of them ran in parallel and for particular characters, you see them uh, in Kirk's early years. And then later on, Kirk encounters them again on the Enterprise uh, only to get, you know, more backstory for that relationship filled in earlier. So I ended up kind of liking how that was structured and uh, how that story formed that way. Yeah, I would agree with you, too. There were times where I was like, well, wait, um, wait, where did I thought this was earlier? Oh, no, this is later. Uh, you know, yeah, I mean. It took me a while at first, but then we get to a point where we stay with the Sacagawea for a while in 2263, and that goes for several chapters for a while. But there were at the beginning, and there was some jumping around that I wouldn't say I got too confused, but just, you know, you really had to kind of pay attention and remember where you were, you know, or where you mm-hmm. are and where you just were, and that, you know, the two are related. And I kept looking at it, like, thinking, like, okay, why are we going to this period and now? Why are we jumping back to that period? What, how do these relate? And so there is a certain theme that goes through this book about how Kirk becomes the captain that he is. So mm-hmm. we'll kind of touch on that a little later. But uh, we did ask Christopher why he decided to write Kirk in this time period before taking command of the Enterprise. And I will read what he says, uh, quote, I've always liked to fill in unexplored gaps in the Star Trek continuity, such as the aftermath of Star Trek The Mission Picture in Ex Machina and Picard's years between the Stargazer and the Enterprise in The Buried Age, which I just read like a few months ago and loved, by the way. That was me. Uh, end of quotes. Okay, quotes again. Chris says, Kirk's <laughs> first command has been alluded to now and again, but never explored in detail. In this case, I was asked to come up with a major story in the TV era of the original series. And the most major story that hadn't been told yet in the current novel continuity was how Kirk's command of the Enterprise began. I realized that telling a new version of that story would also let me examine his first command and how he made enough of a name for himself to be deemed worthy of the Enterprise. End of quote. Yeah, I, I, I loved all of this and exploring those early years. And to me, it almost felt like, you know, the various building blocks of what makes Kirk the kind of captain he is. Where did he learn this lesson? Oh, it was here. Where did he learn this lesson? It was here. It was like we we're getting like step by step kind of how he learned to become the captain that we see in the original series, which I thought was a kind of cool approach. This book definitely focuses on the lessons learned for sure. Yes, I agree with you there. And also how crewmen have to accommodate and learn to trust him because he's a young captain. So some of that's involved too. And because he took command of the Sekigawea, we saw that he then had to deal with a new crew when he first takes command, but then that ship gets damaged to the point that it's out of service for a while. And he comes back to command of it. And now he's got some new crew members. And of course, then when he takes the enterprise, he's got new crew members. So we see him always adjusting to new crew members. And in a lot of ways, I feel as if each command, each of the new crew members seem to, accept him more readily than they did before. Hmm. I would mostly agree. I think the biggest, uh, um, resistance to his command though comes fairly late when he gets to the enterprise and he come, we have his helmsman Lee Kelso, who we saw briefly in where no man has gone before, you know, he was very quickly killed, uh, in that episode. So he's just in the, that only that one episode, but, uh, I thought that was a really interesting story and I liked that perspective. We've got this newcomer who's the youngest captain in Starfleet and not much older than, you know, many of the crew that serve under him. I, I really liked that kind of resistance and you're right. There's a, there's a more early on, I find because at the beginning of his career, he's so young and so, you know, 
in the eyes of people around him inexperienced. And I like that that kind of carries through to the point when Kirk confronts it in Kelso, he's like, huh, this is a complaint I haven't heard in a while. Interesting. (laughs) Yeah. And Kelso is definitely probably the most resistant to Kirk out of anyone we've seen before for the most part. But And because it is later on, the difference to me is the earlier crew members, there was more of a question mark of, I don't know, can he do this? I don't know about this guy. But now he's built a reputation for himself that Kelso is the catalyst that allows the new crewmen and the other crew members to defend Kirk. Even Sulu joined the ship, said, I picked the Enterprise because of Kirk. I wanted to serve with him. They were all defending Kirk. And Kelso showed uh, you know, his resistance to Kirk allowed the other crew members to show their dedication to Kirk, even though they never served with him before, that he had that reputation at this point. Yeah. And it kind of really is the, uh, you know, by the time Kirk has done his career, he's, you know, a living legend kind of thing. And we kind of see the beginnings of that here and why he's able to command these people to follow him and, and inspire them. I thought that was pretty cool. So let's go ahead and go to that earlier part of his uh, command on the Sacagawea. And before I really get into that, I just want to mention to you, Dan, I purposely pictured the crew on this starship in the Discovery uniforms. (laughs) At the risk of raising the ire of certain segments of our listenership. Me too. (laughs) Oh, really? Awesome. Yeah. So I I totally, I was like, okay, the crew on like the Sacagawea and those smaller vessels, they have the Discovery style uniforms. And whenever like Captain Ron Tracy of the Constitution class USS Exeter is contacting him, he had the like the, the Enterprise uniforms that we see Pike and his crew in Discovery wearing. So. I was just like, just kind of mentally altered that in my head reading this. And there was nothing in there that contradicted that. There was only one Mm. time that a uniform color was referred to. And I can't remember which character it was and what the event was, but they said they're blue uniform. I was like, well, that would work for (laughs) Discovery because it was like a medical uniform. Might have been uh, Bones or somebody, but I remember it's being said about the blue uniform. I'm like, well, I know that's probably, you know, Christopher L. Bennett's referring to the blue tunic for (laughs) medical, but you know what? I'm using blue discovery. The one part where it was really interesting in my head was uh, like very early on, we get McCoy treating Kirk at the base and I totally pictured bones in like that white uh, shiny medical uniform from discovery. And I was like, that's an interesting look like, Hmm, I kind of like that. (laughs) Yeah. Okay. Well, that's cool. I had no idea you, did that too. That's so cool. I love it. So <laughs> when I thought uh, of it, I did it, you know? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I even pictured the bridge kind of looking like discovery in a way, but not quite. Yeah. I know. kind of visually updated it in my head a bit as they say. <laughs> <laughs> well, this early part of his career, he takes command of this, uh, of the Sacagawea and he even makes like a mission log or announcement and refers to himself as, James Tiberius Kirk, you know, he's being kind of formal and he's even to himself, he's like, uh, maybe that's a little much or whatever. Cause it's that little awkward, you know, how should I be? I'm now a captain of the ship or whatever. But anyway, through this, uh, this early part of his command, he learns a lesson that he needs to be true to himself and his own principles. Now he was previously in a confrontation with the Klingons in this book where he tried to beat them at their own game. But that mission was not very successful, and he got called out on that because he wasn't being true to his own principles. He was trying to outthink the Klingons in a way by acting like a Klingon, and the Klingons saw right through that. So he learned that he has to stay true to his principles, and he used that when he was in a debate with Koloth on this Shanahara's world where there was this debate going on to unite the these clans that are fighting on this planet. And they even later, when he's talking about the lesson he learned, he quotes uh, Shakespeare's Hamlet and says, this above all to thine own self be true. So this, mm-hmm. to me, this was like the first real lesson that he got out of command because it, it was, I mean, it was his first you know time as a captain of a ship. 
Yeah, I I really appreciated that part because in the moment on the bridge, it seems like such a brilliant maneuver that he's doing and he kind of goads this Klingon captain into getting his ship, you know, destroyed by chasing after him or something like that. But then, yeah, later when he's debriefing, he finds out that, you know, that caused one of their ships to have to come to his aid and that opened up a hole and the Klingons exploited that because the Klingon general or the the commander who was in charge of the mission was kind of realized that opening and that weakness there and that really gives kirk a a powerful lesson here and uh the fact that he really takes that to heart and uses it later i think uh you know again really shows you what kind of captain he's going to be absolutely so those are those little seeds that come throughout this book of all these little lessons uh that he learns along the way And so we did ask Christopher L. Bennett about Kirk's early years because I mentioned to him that, you know, like in the bad robot JJ universe, Kelvin timeline, whatever you want to call the movies, you know, we see him being like, hello, ladies, and being loose and (laughs) whatever, and messing around. And we've seen that in some other books, even the William Shatner uh, Academy book that he came out with a few years ago, which, well, not a few years ago, but like a decade ago, but we covered on a, a previous episode of Literary Treks. Yeah, and the name of the book was uh, Collision Course. So, But Christopher went in a, in a different direction than that. Not to say that it's unique, but I did say, you know, why did he go in this direction with the character who is more serious and not as irresponsible, not a ladies' man? It's even mentioned by Mitchell that, you know, he's got to loosen up and, and, and date. And, you know, I mean, he had some women in his life, but he was taking it more seriously or whatever. And I love uh, Christopher's... Uh, comments here because i think it is more true to the character of kirk than those other representations quote if you look at early tos kirk is written indistinguishably from pike in the cage a serious disciplined officer married to his duties and keeping his desires inhibited in mud's women he's the only human male unaffected by the title character's allure it was only later that his portrayal evolved as the writers adapted to william shatner's performance But even later on, Kirk usually only went after women when he was not in his right mind or when he was playing them for the sake of a mission. More often than not, the women were chasing him rather than the other way around. His more genuine relationships were either old flames like Janet Wallace, who appears in the novel, or women he fell sincerely in love with like Edith Keeler. So Kirk wasn't really a skirt chaser, certainly not compared to the other contemporary TV leading men like Jim West or Napoleon Solo. And the idea of Kirk as a rule-breaking maverick is pretty much entirely a product of the search for Spock. In TOS, he almost never overtly defied orders. Yes, he could be flexible in how he interpreted orders and regulations, But as a frontier captain far removed from higher authorities, that freedom to interpret the rules was part of his responsibilities, not a violation of them. I addressed that theme in the book a couple of times. End of quote. And that is true. He does address Mm -hmm. that because, you know, there's times where he's being told he needs to be more flexible. He is more by the book. He starts to learn as we go along in these stories that he can bend the rules a little or, or take a little more chances and things. And, and a lot of ways kind of go with his gut, but still stay within the boundaries. Yeah. And that definitely makes sense. You know, in where no man has gone before Gary Mitchell talks about Kirk at the Academy and says, you know, he was a stack of books with legs and, you know, watch out for Jim Kirk's class. And in his class, you either think or sink because he's so, you know, rule bound and, and, you know, knows the regulations backward and forward. And, you know, I that's, I do enjoy the Kelvin timeline movies, but that's one of the things that really bugs me is the Kirk in those movies is more of a caricature, like the kind of pop culture idea of what Kirk is rather than what he actually was if you watch the original series. So uh, I, I really like that in this book, it's almost as though Christopher Bennett is kind of making a point of pushing back against that and kind of going like, see, no, this is how Kirk actually is. And I I really like that he's, you know, emphasizing that in this book. I thought that was a good choice. 
in some ways, now I think about it, it's almost like the journey of Picard, because when we see Picard early in the Next Generation series, he's more serious and he gets to be a little more loose, bending the rules, having more of a fun time, not not going by the book all the time, even to the point when we get through the movies that he's loosened up. And Kirk's journey is almost similar to that. And the Buried Age book that Christopher L. Bennett wrote about the early years of Picard kind of shows that Picard wasn't actually so serious. I mean, we've seen mm-hmm. in flashbacks and TNG, but he became more serious because of certain reasons. And then as we go through TNG, he backs back down to the, how he used to be. Yeah, it's kind of, yeah, the early part of Picard's journey is almost the inverse of, of what we know of Kirk, where, you know, in his early years, he got in that fight and got stabbed through the heart and kind of realized, oh, I need to be more serious and all this kind of stuff. And then, yeah, like you said, it kind of comes back around later on. So that's kind of cool. No, yeah, So, yeah, I really enjoyed that. Uh, I think it really is more true to who Kirk is. It Definitely. Mm-hmm. And I was just actually, by the way, at a, a convention called Trek Lanta in Atlanta recently, and the topic of Kirk came up on a panel and they were saying he's more like this than the caricature. I mean, that was a big part of the discussion that uh, like we're hmm. mentioning here. So, Oh, that's cool. Yeah. Well, one of the aspects that I really like about this book is, you know, the like we've been talking about the portrayal of Kirk's uh, earlier command. And that might be something that's not immediately apparent to people who watch Star Trek is that, you know, the enterprise is one of 12 constitution class ships. It's one of the biggest, most powerful ships in the fleet. So it kind of makes sense that Kirk uh, would have been a captain earlier in his career. And I like that you asked uh, Christopher Bennett directly about this, you know, uh, why did you decide to, you know, make Kirk the commander of a starship for the Enterprise and, you know, what were kind of references that he used for that? Well, so to quote Christopher Bennett, he says, It was stated back in 1968's The Making of Star Trek, co-written by Gene Roddenberry, that Kirk's first command was a small destroyer-equivalent vessel. That first command was mentioned in passing in the second pilot as well. So I didn't decide anything. It's always been a part of Kirk's backstory. Most earlier prose and comics portrayals of Kirk's early career have acknowledged that previous command under different names. It was the Saladin and the Oxford in two different DC Comics versions of Kirk's backstory, the Lydia Sutherland in Vonda McIntyre's novel Enterprise The First Adventure, the Hotspur in David A. Goodman's autobiography of James T. Kirk. The only tie-in story I can think of that portrayed the Enterprise as Kirk's first command is the brief biography feature from Gold Key Comics Enterprise Logs collection from 1976. Gold Key Comics coming up again. Oh, man. (laughs) That that part wasn't a quote. Anyway, going back to the quote. Since there have been so many contradictory versions, I mostly went in my own direction with it. My goal was to write a version of Kirk's journey to the Enterprise that fit into the current novel continuity, since I realized it's been lacking one for a long time. But it did throw in some winks in the direction of the DC and Gold Key stories I just mentioned, and a few references to stories from the novel continuity that touch on the period in question, such as Mere Anarchy and SCE Foundations. End quote. (laughs) See, one thing I like is Christopher Bennett is an encyclopedia of knowledge about all this tie-in material that he Mm -hmm. can just quote. And I don't know, maybe he looked them up, but he seems, because I see in Trek BBS, he seems to always be able to refer to, oh, this was mentioned here, this was mentioned there, or whatever. And he usually does annotations of his novels eventually on his website. I mean, this wouldn't be out there now, but maybe sometime in the next several months or so he might have that. And we will see where he brought in certain elements from the DC and Gold Key stories into it. One thing that I really liked about this too is he mentions the class name of the Sacagawea and I I think it was the Saladin class he said it was which if you know the Franz Joseph original series technical manual is that one that has like a st- like a typical saucer section with the neck coming down and then just a single warp nacelle so that was cool, oh, cool that because he mentioned that I was able to picture that ship uh, during the book. So it was cool. Oh, wow. Yeah. See, I didn't know that. That's really cool. I think it was Saladin class. I could be wrong about the class name, but whatever it was, it was like that, that layout that you see 
in the technical manual. So I, I love those Franz Joseph's early designs. You know, those are really cool. So that was neat to picture. Awesome. Yeah, that is cool. See, this is why I like doing this, because I learned this stuff. <laughs> <laughs> so the other aspect of this book is we do get some original characters in this novel. So, for example, Kirk has a first officer when he first, first takes command of the Seca Gawea, and that is Commander Maron Egdor. Is that right, Jan? I think so. That's how I would pronounce it. <laughs> okay. Now, this is an alien. I don't remember which species. I'm sure that was mentioned, but I can't recall off the top of my head. I can't remember either. Uh, Regellian, maybe? No. Yeah, I think, no. Ah, I don't know. Oh, wow. You guys need to read the book if you haven't, and then you can let us know in the Babel Conference. So anyway, (laughs) that's his first uh, commander, first officer of the Sacagawea. And then later, after a break, when he goes to the Vega colony... He takes command back of the Sacagawea. Now he has a new first officer, Commander Ashu Adebayo. I don't even know if I'm pronouncing that right. I remember he's Nigerian and he's human. So um, obviously if he's Nigerian and uh, and he's older, which I really thought that was interesting because Kirk is such a young captain. And here's this much older man, much experience that hasn't had a command. And he's OK with that. He mm-hmm. is perfectly satisfied and happy with where his career is. I don't think he necessarily wants to have command of a starship. I really like the perspectives of both of these characters. So like you said, Commander Adebayo is uh, an older person who's content where he is. You know, he has risen up the chain of command to where he wants to be. He kind of sees himself as shepherding younger captains and making them the best they can be. And he's decided, you know, the first officer role is where he shines. And I thought that was really cool. And also Commander Egdor, I thought, you know, that perspective that, you know, we mostly see humans in Starfleet and he kind of brings that idea that, you know, would I have gotten the same opportunities that James T. Kirk got because I'm not a human being? And I think that was kind of an important part to have these characters kind of examine their biases and that sort of thing. And I really appreciated that that was brought into it. And, you know, that a character like Kirk can say you know, can kind of reflect on himself and say, like, do I hold these biases? Is this, you know, from a place of privilege, do I not recognize that privilege? So I I thought that was a really cool kind of self-reflective moment for him. Yeah, I'm glad you mentioned that scene. That is one of my favorite scenes in this book, because being Star Trek fans and seeing and reading so much Star Trek, so many of the crew is of the different starships and star bases are mostly human. And there's an issue with that in the fact that those who are alien to earth that join Starfleet uh, don't have the same privileges. And that's a reflection on our own world, our own societies where those that are in the minority have different struggles. It's harder to get to the top or harder to get to where you want to go because you have these hurdles and there's certain people that get certain privileges and that's addressed here. And you don't want to think of the Federation Starfleet as doing that. Even Kirk says he doesn't even want to think that that's going on, but more than likely there's probably is some truth to that. Mm -hmm. And I like the idea that it probably informs some of his decisions toward the end of the novel when they're dealing with the Agni and taking that alien perspective into account, into account, you know, realizing maybe they see things differently from the way we do. And, you know, taking the time to kind of look from different perspectives. I think that really uh, is an important building block to the kind of captain he becomes later on in the book. And I also want to just point out right now, I mean, we're going deeper into the book, so we're probably hitting more spoiler territory. So if you haven't read the book and you don't want to be spoiled, then come back later at this point. One thing I do want to mention, um, and it's not a big part of the book, but again, this is something that Kurt has to deal with because when he takes command back of the Sacagawea, and he has this new first officer, his previous first officer is now commanding a different starship and in the end dies. Um, this is on a mission where the Enterprise is also there helping out the ship, 
while these uh, alien ships that we're going to get into later start attacking the two. But um, that Enterprise is being commanded by Pike. So mm-hmm. um, again, I'm picturing the Discovery bridge and uniform, like the Enterprise the Discovery Enterprise version, whatever it is, you know, uh, you know, from this, <laughs> I was picturing that. But anyway, he lost his former first officer there. So again, we're seeing seeing Kirk dealing with the loss of a officer he was fairly close to. Yeah, and it's clear that you know it affects him pretty hard, right? Because this was somebody that he'd worked with. And what's interesting is they have their differences. Like I kind of liked that relationship where you know Kirk was pursuing this. Uh, plan and his first officer would you know say i I don't know think this is the right course captain i think we should do this but kirk kind of you know follows his own counsel and and oftentimes surprises this first officer of his who's like oh i i didn't expect that okay that makes sense i get it now and uh the fact that he's gone on now in his career and it ends it sadly in tragedy really does affect kirk quite a bit absolutely and then we also have a character dr sharev that uh, is Andorian, who was a well. He met her on the Vega colony. She's uh, she's a archaeologist, but she also uh, is she serves in Starfleet, and she becomes his science officer when he takes uh, retakes command of the Sacagawea. And uh, I, I really like this character. I would think out of the original characters to this novel. She's my favorite one because she has a lot of spunk. I mean, of course, you know, she's Andorian, but she's very (laughs) determined uh, in her archaeology and what her mission is and what her goals are. And she's very focused on that. I think that's something that Kirk even learns from her is to follow your passion and not necessarily just follow the rules. Yeah, I really like uh, the kind of challenges, you know, first the friendship that they form. And she's obviously someone that because he served with her and has seen her value and, and intelligence really admires her. But, you know, later in the novel kind of almost becomes a little bit of a foil for Kirk where she she has this almost single minded, I wouldn't say obsession, but, you know, this for for archaeological discoveries and that sort of thing she's very focused and sometimes relies on Kirk to kind of pull her butt out of the fire a few times when that's gotten her into trouble and then like later in the novel when Kirk's in command of the Enterprise he encounters her again and she once again is kind of pushing the boundaries and and it's it's interesting to see those two characters and how they relate to each other on a very emotional level, like there's this very um, kind of emotional scene where Kirk's talking to her and says, don't make me do this again. Like you're, you're doing it to me again and you're making me choose and I, I can't choose your side this time. Uh, and it's a really moving scene and it's interesting given how things proceed from there and how everything turns out. But at that moment, it's, it's heart wrenching for both him and for her. Uh, some really good stuff going on here. Well, Christopher Bennett sent us his comments about the character of Sharev and says that, quote, mainly I wanted some noteworthy female and alien characters in Kirk's early cruise to balance out the preponderance of human males in the TOS cast. I wanted a science officer and friend for Kirk who would be a contrast to Spock and who would complement the early, more serious Kirk, similarly to how Spock complemented the later, more loose and relaxed Kirk. As for inspirations, I was initially thinking of Nicole Bahari, who played Abby Mills on the Sleepy Hollow TV series a few years back, and whose strength and charisma really impressed me. But Sharev ended up evolving in her own distinct direction. I've written plenty of strong, dynamic, witty female leads in my fiction over the years. So at this point, it's just doing what comes naturally, though I'm pleased that each one manages to develop her own individual voice and style along the way. Yeah. And and yeah, again, I mean, great character. And I love how he mentions about the, the contrast with with Spock. Kirk has and then the one he has with Sharev because he's not as loose and she is and by the time Kirk gets the Enterprise and I think she even mentions that he would make a good uh, Spock would compliment Kirk well because Spock would be so serious that 
Kirk will feel that he's able to loosen up because Spock will be mm-hmm. the more serious of the two. Yeah, I thought that was interesting. I never really thought of that kind of contrasting them, but it makes sense that they're both in the science officer role and and that Christopher Bennett was setting that up. That's very cool. Um, I, I like the the idea of like these characters kind of balancing out Kirk's tendencies and, and personality. And, you know, speaking of characters with their own individual voice and style, I really also liked, uh, Ensign Diaz, the, uh, there's a science ensign when Kirk's dealing with the Agni, who are these, um, very alien creatures who we'll talk about in a minute. And he needs somebody to translate, uh, and, and she, manages to do this and there's some interesting drama there Uh, this character i really like and they're dealing with this uh alien species who are threatening these cities on this planet in the regulus system where this ensign is from and she's got friends there and and one friend in particular and there's this really interesting emotional story arc for ensign diaz which was a nice surprise in this book I, i found myself really invested in these secondary characters um, and Ensign Diaz in particular, who, you know, makes some choices and, and ends up, you know, paying the price for those choices and that sort of thing. And again, is used to show the kind of Captain Kirk would be who cares for his crew members and, and you know, is willing to shepherd them and guide them in certain ways. And, I you know, I... I I just, I found myself really liking the secondary characters more than I thought I, than I usually do in, in these novels. Yeah. I'm with you on that. I really loved her character too. I say she's probably my second favorite character. So very close, uh, second to Sharev. Um, mm-hmm. I would love to see a novel. It's just the two of them doing something together. <laughs> that would be really <laughs> That'd cool. <be> cool. <laughs> so, but you mentioned about the Agni. Uh, yeah. So they're the ones that, you know, they're the bad aliens, apparently, but not really. But of course, that's what it's perceived because their ships have been attacking the Federation uh, ships and the and the Klingons and so on and so forth and attacking these worlds and planets. But there's a reason for that. It's not in an evil kind of way. Uh, that's not what they're trying to do. And they're looking for the class N atmospheres that are different uh, than what we're used to because they're from this. They have a different view of the universe than what we have. So, um, they're very strange looking. Um, I remember they have like sacks that they breathe, you know, in and out and horns to the point that they're in this different atmosphere that they had to be enclosed with a partition between our crew members. And then they're in their atmosphere behind this other partition. And it's hard to really see them in a way. And and Kirk's trying to communicate with them. And I think it was Diaz that was helping with the communication, right? That she was translating Mm -hmm. what they were saying and having to read it back. Yeah. And it it was interesting. Uh, basically they're, they're kind of described as these big, like mollusk type things. They have like a shell and, uh, they don't really see like we, we do. They sense, you know, infrared and other things like that. And, uh, it's actually the enterprise and this junior, uh, junior communications, uh, specialist named Uhura, who actually helps out with some of the translations and sends, sends information to the Sacagawea and, uh, Diaz is able to, you know, formulate how to communicate with them and stuff. So it's kind of neat tying it in there. Um, and yeah, this, the, the communication that develops, we learn that everything was kind of a bit of a misunderstanding. They don't really see space the same way that we do. They don't, you know, drawing a boundary in space doesn't mean anything to them. That's just the in-between. What matters are the planets. And we don't have any use for class N type planets, which is kind of like Venus and planets like that. So they didn't think that they were doing anything wrong. They were just, you know, trying to get to these other planets because their world had been, you know, not destroyed, but uh, had become uninhabitable. So they were basically refugees and trying to find their way and and find some place where they could live. And for some reason, all these cold life forms, which is how they refer to, you know, humanoids like us and, and that sort of thing, kept trying to stop them and just kept blowing up their ships and killing them. And they couldn't understand why. So I thought that right. was There's really a misunderstanding between the two, right? 
yeah, just a complete misunderstanding and, and that they don't see the universe the same way. So, uh, I, I like that you asked Chris about these, uh, aliens and kind of how they came about. And he says, I've always been interested in developing aliens that were plausibly non-humanoid in both anatomy and culture ever since I learned enough science in my teens to realize how unlikely humanoid aliens are. I've invented a lot of non-humanoids for my original fiction over the years, some of which I've recycled as Star Trek aliens. So reasoning out alien physiologies and cultures based on their environments and evolutionary histories is an old habit by now. The Agni are loosely based on a species I created for my original fiction a couple of decades ago, for a story that never quite worked out the way I had hoped. They're actually rather less strange in their worldview than the aliens they were based on, since I still hope to use those aliens in an original story someday. So yeah, I, I love that not only are they very alien looking and, and strange to human eyes, but also their worldview and the way they perceive the universe and how they see things like territory and ownership and that sort of thing are very different. And, and it's not just the fact that they're different, but Christopher Bennett gives very plausible reasons for how they developed that way as well in the novel, which I, I love when that much thought goes into something like this. Yeah. It's not just, here are these aliens and they're different, but this is why this is the science behind it. This is how they evolved into this. This is why this atmosphere only works for them and doesn't work for us and that sort of thing. So it gives them more realism to the story. You know, you can actually, and that's something again, you don't really get like on a TV show necessarily or in a movie that you can really dig deeper into these aliens and make them even feel more alien and then get to really understand where they've come from and how they evolved in that way. So I really appreciate that about the books that we get that opportunity and he took advantage of that in this book. So yeah, I really enjoyed that. And I also enjoyed the Diaz character in this too, because you mentioned earlier how she kind of had to pay the price because uh, the planet that this is all taking place on where there's these cloud cities and uh, the, the Agni want to be in the lower atmosphere of the planet and the, the members of this planet who are in these cloud cities that are doing mining don't, you know, they're on the more defensive side of things feeling like, no, they're here to attack us. They're not here to, share a planet with us and live in harmony. We, we don't believe them. And this, this Orloff character is really uh, working even on Diaz to say, Hey, you know, we got to protect ourselves. And, and she kind of follows the advice of going uh, through an attack scenario, but then Kirk, you know, realizes that and she backs away from it. Yeah. And I really like how that works out. And you know, Diaz feels like she's thrown away her career because of this mistake she's made. And Kirk is very understanding of it. And, you know, he's like, you've made attempts to fix it and we have fixed it. Like, you know, you still, of course, will have a severe reprimand on your record, but, you know, I want you to be the permanent liaison between, you know, the Agni and Starfleet and, and, you know, continue your work here as, kind of penance basically for what she's done and you know it's the perfect it's the perfect thing for her she's able to kind of um, redeem herself in in the eyes of you know the agony as as well as her own people and kirk and his crew and we didn't really talk that much about the ships if you look at the cover you get to see the alien ships of the agony here and and the panels that are are used in the inside uh, propulsion system and weapon or whatever that is almost like, you know, the power of almost like a black hole or something. And, and those panels, you know, expand and contract and, and they're, those panels are then used to also to attack ships. And, and that's how Kirk lost his first, his very previous first officer or whatever, when he was in command of another ship and we don't have time to get all into the workings of the ship, but even those felt alien because they don't operate like a typical starship, like we're used to seeing. And then, yeah. And at the end of the novel, they even bring up how, you know, Oh, now that we know that they weren't, you know, on the offensive, we can see how they were just adapting the systems they had to use them as weapons and they're actually not that great weapons anyway. They're, you know, the power cost is too great or, you know, all this stuff. So I, I thought that was really interesting. I, again, I just love when things like that are thought through so thoroughly like this. 
so yeah, now, you know, we get to a point too, where we see Kirk first in command of enterprise. We see Pike hand the keys over to him basically. And, and Kirk accepting Spock as his first officer and Gary Mitchell's coming on to serve as the second officer. And, uh, he's acclimating himself to the ship and the crew as they're sent on a mission to Carabos two to remove a Federation archeology span group. And the plan is being terraformed by the Alacri by directing asteroids towards the planet to impact the surface, thus creating water. So that's how they're terraforming it with these asteroids. However, the archeologists are here on the planet and Kirk has to go and retrieve them, get them off the planet before the asteroids hit because they're Federation members they are not Starfleet members, but who and behold there it's Dr. Sharev. She's there. Cause she's not part of Starfleet, but now she's part of this archeological crew. And they've discovered this underground site left by the extinct inhabitants of that planet. So uh, she refuses to leave and Skiver of the Alacri refused to slow down the asteroids and the, you know, we can't stop this. You got to get the team out of there. And the team's like, no, they've got to stop the asteroids from coming because we found this site. So it's this back and forth. So Kirk's kind of caught in the middle of this. Yeah. And again, you know, this was, I thought a really great kind of showcase of, the kind of Captain Kirk has become now at the conclusion of all of the lessons he's learned earlier in his career and then kind of projecting forward to what we'll see later on. You know, he's still, you know, rule bound and 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 wants to obey the laws of the Federation, but recognizes that there's something of greater importance here when Spock kind of realizes that there's some deep hidden secret here that will definitely fundamentally change the outlook for the Alacri uh, and and how they view their world and their relationship with this planet that they're terraforming, which, you know, they say was a world um, inhabited by a group of people that hunted them and, and killed them and that sort of thing. But, uh, you know, and it's good that they're being wiped, their memory is being wiped out now because they were so horrible and that sort of thing. But Spock and Dr. Shrev feel there's something else going on here and want to uncover what that is. And Kirk eventually realizes that this is a big enough um, revelation that they, they're they right and they deserve to know the truth before it's completely wiped out. And this whole situation, I thought, was a really interesting uh, just kind of test of all of what Kirk has learned up to this point in the novel. Yeah, because then we find out that the Alacri are actually related to these previous inhabitants. They thought they were two different species that had fought, you know, millennia ago, and now have come to find out, no, they were of the same species. Just some decided to leave because the planet was maybe getting too warlike, and uh, they're actually they're all related. So mm-hmm. it all works out in the end. They decide not to you know, have the asteroids crash on the planet, but then there's enough that when they divert the asteroids, it brings some water and Spock figures out there's a way to grow plants or whatever. So there's some terraforming going on while still preserving this archeological site. Um, Mm -hmm. And what's really cool is like a lot of the information that they gain from this archeological site helps them in the terraforming because included there is a bunch of the scientific research that will help rebuild the planet as well as like genetic samples of the people and the ability to recreate them and clone them. So, you know, that entire society isn't completely wiped out now. It can be kind of rebirthed on this world and terraformed in that way, which I thought was a really cool conclusion to that. And also during this time period, we see a scene where Sharev reaches out to McCoy to join Kirk on the Enterprise because Kirk had already asked McCoy to join him as his chief medical officer and McCoy's thinking about, and Sharev knows McCoy from the Vega colony from earlier in this book. And that's where Kirk McCoy and Sharev all met. So they had a Mm -hmm. bond on the Vega uh, colony and uh, briefly served together on the Sacagawea. And then, you know, McCoy goes off and does something and Sharev goes off, does something. And now Sharev says, Hey, you know, Kirk could use you. He needs you. It remind me of the motion picture. I need your bones. <laughs> and we also get the totally. where the bones, saw bones came because Kirk and McCoy and they first met on the Vega co- colony 
kind of go at each other, you know, arguing with each other. And Kirk calls and says something about sawbones. And McCoy's like, did you just say sawbones? And that's where the nickname <laughs> came from of bones. Yeah, exactly. Um, I, I really like that, that kind of basically showing what the importance of McCoy's friendship will be with Kirk going forward. And, you know, the completion of that triumvirate between him, Spock and McCoy, I think uh, that's such an important part of Star Trek. And just I've already loved the character of Sherev so much. So adding in the fact that she was so instrumental in bringing McCoy to the Enterprise, I'm like, ah, man, I knew I really liked her. She's so great. <laughs> <laughs> well, you would also ask like, a question to Christopher. and I thought maybe you could read this one because you're asking about, you know, tying strings of continuity together and relating to the episode Q2 from Voyager. Absolutely. So yeah, that's one thing that Christopher L. Bennett has a reputation for is taking all these really disparate pieces of continuity and little references here and there and tying them all together into a cohesive narrative. So for example, like the, the department of temporal investigations, that first novel took all of the instances of time travel and tied them all together. And, you know, in this novel, uh, we learn about the Chinari, which is a species that Kirk saved from extinction. And that's just from one line in a Voyager episode where Icheb is giving a book report about Captain Kirk and just mentions that the Chinari were among the species saved by Kirk during his career and stuff. So, you know, I was curious what are, what was some of Christopher Bennett's favorite continu continuity linking bits from the captain's oath. And he says, probably getting to flesh out Kirk's early encounters with characters that TOS implied he had a history with, like Koloth and Robert Wesley. I liked how I was able to combine Kirk's bout with vegan chorio-meningitis with the establishment of a key friendship. Continuity nods can be fun, but the real purpose of fiction is to explore characters, relationships, and ideas, so the reference games should serve those ends rather than being an end in themselves." What I liked doing more was telling stories that weren't linked to prior continuity, filling in new adventures and new relationships, and showing how they were as meaningful to Kirk's life as the stuff we knew about before. We've seen multiple prose and comics versions of the bits of Kirk's backstory we heard about on screen, the Farragut, the Demaris incident, Carol Marcus, things like that. So my desire was to look beyond those familiar bits and delve into stuff we haven't seen explored before. And, you mean explain, yeah. e explore strange new things? Yeah, crazy in a Star Trek novel. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, no, I, I love that. I love that, you know, we do get those little continuity touchstones that I love. I mean, we, we even have the Akamarians from Star Trek The Next Generation. Uh, those feature early on. Um, but Chris, Chris Bennett makes a very good point here about, you know, that stuff should always be in the service of the story rather than an end in and of themselves. So I, I like that, you know, making them relevant, not just name dropping for the sake of name dropping, but having it be, you know, something that relates back to the story and adds something very real to it. I, I absolutely agree. And I think that's, that's the best part of it for me. I agree. So I'm just going to go ahead and, like start give our final thoughts on this because that just totally leads into what I think of the book. So my thoughts are that um, in our ratings that that period of time for this character is such an important period of time that we haven't explored much. So it is great to explore something that hasn't been explored before. And it's amazing that we haven't, out of all these years and all these books haven't really explored what he was doing. Kirk was doing and how he became the captain. He was before he got to the enterprise. Sure. It's been touched on here and there and a little there and, and things about his years in the Academy or the times when he met Carol Marcus. or the first time he may have met Spock at some point or whatever, but this is really touching on that growth of, okay, you are now a captain of a starship, not the enterprise, but you're now a new captain of a smaller starship and you're going to go through some lessons to get to the point that you are before you take command of the enterprise. So it's that period, those few years that really defines the character, not the character of Kirk, but defines the character of captain Kirk. And I think mm -hmm. that's a very important place in the history of this character 
And it's surprising we haven't gotten that until now. So I think this book does an excellent job of that. And, you know, when I first finished reading the book, I really enjoyed it. But, you know, I'm really realizing how good it is, even more so now that we're talking through it and reflecting back on things. So at this point, I would give this book four and a half out of five Sawbones. Oh, very nice. That's definitely a good rating. Yeah, I, I, I... I'm having a hard time adding a lot to what you just said. I like that, you know, we have this character who, you know, is constantly referred to for at least a hundred years after his heyday as, you know, one of the legends of Starfleet, right? And one of the most influential captains in Starfleet history and all this sort of stuff. And we kind of think of him as being placed fully formed in the captain's chair of the enterprise in the first episode that he's in, in the original series. And it, that's not how life works. The, the beautiful part of this story is showing the building of that character and like what makes him the captain that would go on to be so important to Starfleet history. And, it makes sense that there's a lot before we see of this, of the five-year mission that would serve that end. Because like we said, you know, he's captain of the enterprise. That's one of the most prestigious ships in Starfleet, the constitution class. So to get to see those lessons that he learns here and the, the huge victories. So not just military victories, but like scientific victories and, and historic discoveries and, and all this kind of stuff all goes into making him, you know, both the soldier and the diplomat that we see in Star Trek. So yeah, I I definitely love this novel. I think I would have to give it probably four and a half plates that form on the outside of the ship that get thrown as weapons. But, uh, you know, their original purpose was just shielding. So, you know, they're they're really a good defensive weapon. (laughs) I'm just picturing you in a kitchen throwing plates right now. (laughs) 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 only on trips to Greece. (laughs) (laughs) Well, we don't want to end this feature without calling out some things for Christopher L. Bennett. And first of all, I want to thank him for sending in his comments. It's uh, really great to get into the mind of him and see where he was coming at with some of these aspects of the novel, but he's got a lot of other things going on right now. He has crimes of the hub coming out It's his second collection of stories from his hub comedy science fiction series from Analog Magazine. It's expanded and merged into a short novel, and that should be out soon in ebook and trade paperback. He has his first fantasy story, The Melody Lingers, which will be out in July in Galaxy's Edge magazine. And he has two upcoming stories featuring the troubleshooters. It's the space going superheroes from his novel Only Superhuman. Now, the first, The Stuff That Dreams Are Made Of, will appear in the anthology Footprints in the Stars, debuting at the Shortleaf Convention in Baltimore on July 12th through the 14th. The second, Conventional Powers, will be out in Analog later this year. Now, he's also written uh, some other mission scenarios for the Star Trek Adventures role-playing game from Modifius Entertainment. Two are already on sale as downloadable PDFs with two more coming soon. And he also wrote one of the 10 missions in Star Trek Adventures, Strange New Worlds, Mission Compendium, Volume 2. And that will be out in hardcover this August. So check out his homepage called Written Worlds. And that is at ChristopherLBennett.wordpress.com. And you can follow him on Facebook. His fan page is facebook.com slash Christopher L. Bennett author. Well, that was a lot of fun. It was interesting to have the author on the show, but not really on the show. I guess, can we, can we count this as like a 0.5 in Christopher Bennett's uh, number of times on the show column? Is that fair? Sure. I just take it that, you know, we, we read his book. He was here in spirit. So it's like he was here all along. Yeah, I think so. (laughs) (laughs) Well, it's been fun talking about Christopher L. Bennett's spirit today, but it's not the only thing we've been discussing here on the network. So here's a quick look at some of the other things you may have missed elsewhere on Trek FM. Previously on Trek.FM, the orb. 
I'm not sure that our mindset has necessarily changed drastically from 1993 to 2019. Perhaps it has. I think it has a bit. But the tendency for this kind of thing to happen may have been there then. But the difference is that today we have these platforms like Twitter and Facebook that amplify it, and it is much easier for people to get together into these groups and push a certain agenda or attack an individual. Melodic tricks. But I, I did actually look. Look back to a lot of the older stuff, like the the Jerry Goldsmith scores and even like the James Horner scores. I thought those the orchestration style, like I thought, was really really cool to me. Kind of had this more classical, like using only the orchestra but creating these spooky textures and stuff. I, I always really love that that kind of sound. Literary tricks. <laughs> and all of a sudden, we see a panel that shows where Kirk and Chris. Are. I want to call her crispy for a second. <laughs> There's uh, Spock and Crisp, I think, right? Okay, that, uh, yeah, Spock and Crisp. I love that cereal. <laughs> and <laughs> I had some Kellogg's Spock and Crisp the other day. Warp 5. To, to, yeah, you don't give them the tools they need moving forward. It's great to give someone their freedom, but you have to then stay there and help them to get to the next step so that they don't need you anymore. To do that. That was the problem with the episode. And I think that plays a big role in not just this episode, but society in general. We've done that a lot in other countries and we've gone and knocked out regimes and, you know, whatever. And then we don't do anything for the people there. So we're back in the same boat or a worse boat than we were when we started. And that's what else is happening on Trek.fm. Check out all these shows and join the conversation about your favorite corner of the Star Trek universe and beyond. And you'll find us wherever you get your podcasts. If you're an Apple user, be sure to hit the subscribe button in Apple Podcasts on iPhone, iPad, or Apple TV, or the desktop iTunes app to get the latest episodes as soon as they're published. And please leave us a star rating and written review. But if you're not an Apple user... Don't worry, we've got you covered as well. You can find our shows on Google Play Music, Stitcher, TuneIn, Spreaker, SoundCloud, Windows Phone, YouTube, in most third-party apps, and you can stream and download the MP3 file from our website or grab the RSS link. If you'd like to help us keep all our shows coming to you each week, you can become a patron of the network on Patreon. Visit patreon.com slash trekfm. That's p-a-t-r-e-o-n dot com slash trekfm to get all the details. Perks include early access to episodes, exclusive content, producer credits, and more available through our special patrons website, Patron Zone. It requires a great deal of money to produce, host, and distribute these shows each month. We really appreciate any support you can give us and hope you'll join the team. Again, you'll find all the details at patreon.com slash trekfm. We'd love to hear any thoughts you may have on today's show, and there are many ways for you to do that. The best place to join in the larger conversation is the Babel Conference. That's our listeners group on Facebook. Just type Babel, that's B-A-B-E-L, into the search field on Facebook, and it should come right up. If you'd like to send us an email, you can use the form on our website at trek.fm slash contact. Choose to send to a show and select Literary Treks. That'll come right to us. You can also find the network on Twitter, we're at trek.fm, and on Facebook at facebook.com slash trek.fm. Find us on our Goodreads group where we have a bookshelf with all of our previously covered books as well as what we're currently reading. That section is in there too, so you know what is coming up for future shows. Like, for example, if you were in Goodreads now, you would know that Star Trek The Next Generation Resistance is the next episode coming up. So we have great conversations happening about the books and comics, so just search for Literary Treks on Goodreads and click Join Group. And we'd like to thank Norman C. Lau, Ken Tripp, Greg Rosier, Brandon Shea Mutala, Justin Ozer, and Jeffrey Harlan for their support of the Trek FM network and being associate producers for Literary Treks as well. So Dan, when you're not in the kitchen throwing plates at me, where can people find you? <laughs> well, when I'm not doing that, you can find me on Twitter. I'm at Kurtrats. That's K-E-R-T-R-A-T-S. You can also find me on Facebook.com slash Kurtrats Productions and youtube.com slash Kurtratz Productions, where I have a YouTube channel dedicated mostly to Star Trek. And of course, you can find me in the Babel Conference. 
And Bruce, when you're not finding your vacation to the cloud city of Stratos uh, unexpectedly delayed because you're called away on a critical mission for Starfleet, where can we find you? Once I get through the clouds, you can find me on Twitter at Admiral underscore Rex. And you can find me here on the network doing live from the edge when new episodes of Discovery come out. The next day we do a live show, me and Brandy Jacola. And uh, that's on YouTube. And then it comes out as an audio podcast. And then, of course, you can find me on the Star Wars report talking about Star Wars because you know, there's something going on over there, too. And I'll be at Galaxy's Edge at Disneyland in about a month or two, something like that. No, in less than a month. Wow, it's coming up soon. So, yeah. Anyway, and you can find me, of course, in the Babel Conference as always. So thank you, everyone, for listening. And until next time, live long and read on. You call that light reading? To each his own, number one.